Good evening, everyone. My name is Judith Sidney, and I am one of the co-founders of Womenology. Thank you for coming to our second session of our program. Womenology was built on the philosophy that there is nothing stronger, more meaningful, or more powerful than women helping women. It's natural for us women to reach out to other women for advice, to find reliable resources, and for a shared sense of community and connection. To that end, we are thrilled you've joined us tonight to become more informed and more knowledgeable on how to keep you and your family cyber secure. I am thrilled to introduce you to Nancy Viner and Susan Whittemore to lead the conversation. Before I turn it over to Nancy and Susan, just a few housekeeping items. Please mute yourselves, turn on your cameras, and feel free to put any questions into the chat as we will be monitoring it this evening. Please note, we're recording the official presentation and it will be posted on our Womenology site along with the resource materials. Nancy and Susan, the Zoom room is all yours. Thank you, Jude, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, Nancy and I have been doing these presentations and working together in the cyber world for years now. We both spent some time at Fidelity Investments and have been doing some engagements and talks um, for some time now. So it's, 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 we're thrilled to be here and be walking through this presentation with you. So question, how many of you have had your identity or email accounts compromised? Or do you know someone who has? Probably all of you, right? Every day you see something in the news, you talk to a neighbor. I talked to somebody just this morning who had their wallet stolen. I got an email notification just last week that one of my passwords had been compromised and I should log into whatever the site was and change my password. And it's tax season. Um, I have a, a friend of mine who couldn't file his tax return last year because someone had already filed it on his behalf. We're going to see a lot more of that this year and the instances of identity fraud and, and compromise just keep growing and growing. So the stats are, are ever increasing. Um, there's one that I heard fairly recently, 60% uh, of small businesses that get compromised will not survive um, due to the, the costs of recovery, the costs associated with their reputation, credit monitoring, consumer issues, um, they simply will not survive. Um, 3.9 million average cost of a breach, large, obviously large companies pay more, small companies pay less, but that's an awful lot of money to have to spend. And probably the reason by, why some of those smaller businesses just go out of business. Um, much of the hacking related to breaches is due to compromised passwords. And we're going to talk a lot about passwords and preventing your passwords from being used. There are billions of IDs and passwords on the dark web today that can be purchased by hackers to be used to try and get into your systems. And one of the ways that they will get your password is with a phishing email. So if you see the stat, 94% of cyber attacks begin with some kind of phishing email to try and get your information. And we're going to go through a few of those situations. So what are the cyber threats? Some common scenarios. There are, there are a lot of scenarios, but we'll go through some of the common ones. Malware, very common. You hear about viruses, antivirus software. It's, it's, in a, it's in a big bucket called ransomware today. They are, they are types of software that might um, encrypt your uh, PC and give you a message, right? Your PC cannot be used until you pay money. The ransomware perpetrators will take Bitcoin. They'll, they'll take a credit card. And until you pay, you will not get your data and your computer back. Um, others will be what they call banking Trojans, and they might def deflect a payment from your bank account into theirs. It might just be malicious code that is logging everything you do. So malware is a, is a huge common scenario and a big threat to all of us who use a PC and are connected to the internet. Credential theft, that's what I talked about in terms of of luring you into exposing your ID and password. Those billions of, of IDs and passwords that are out there are out there for purchase. I can purchase 
a hundred thousand of them and then run them through a program to just keep trying various websites with those passwords. And if you use the same password from system to system, maybe you use the same password on your social media as your bank, right? And one of those gets compromised. It's very likely that if someone's running a program trying to get into a system with one of your passwords, there's a chance that they could. Um, and then a breach. Um, most of the time these days, the hackers are not scanning the network, looking for an open door, sneaking in a little piece of code. If they, there's so many IDs and passwords out there for, for purchase that it's typical that they would get in using someone's stolen credentials versus a hack, although um, it still happens today. All right, social engineering. This is how you're compromised generally today. Social engineering is an art. It's the art of manipulating people. Think about a scenario where someone calls you and says, um, oh, I'm, I, I got an alert about your ADP home security system. And you, and you say, I don't have ADP home security system. Well, aren't you at 22 Smith Road? Well, yes, I am, but I don't have ADP. Oh, 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 okay, we must have made a mistake. What do you have, Ring? Everyone's got Ring these days. Yeah, I have Ring, I love it. You have a little conversation, you hang up and you realize a person had your phone number, now has your address, now knows what kind of home security system you have. So that is a social engineering tactic. Friendly, looking for information, um, casual conversation, and you've all and you've given up some pretty sensitive information, and they use that trust. Think about um, uh, the elderly population is particularly at risk. Lots of lots of opportunity there. Um, the call from a grandchild—that's an actual scenario. There was some fraudsters calling, indicating to elderly people, that, that, acting like they were the grandchild. I'm so sorry. Grandpa, I, I'm in jail, I'm in trouble. I need you to wire me some money. I can't reach mom and dad, or whatever the scenario is. And of course, pulling at the heartstrings, grandpa sends money and it's actually a fraudster. I just got a call last week that I have a debt that needed to be collected. Nasty email message that I had, nasty voicemail message that I needed to call back or somebody was going to take action. I know I don't have any debts. They didn't say what company they were calling from. They didn't say what the debt was. They just wanted a phone call back so they could try and make me give a credit card number to, to, to pay that supposed debt. Social engineering is, is a um, very, very typical way that people get compromised. Okay, some examples of the fish that I talked about. This one looks pretty legitimate, right? It's a little bit urgent. I love Netflix. I want my account to be in good shape so I can binge watch my, my series tonight. Um, it generally includes a link. This one's an actual um, fraudulent email that was sent. Very good looking message. Visit your account. Um, there's a link here. That link probably asked for my ID and password or was a link that, that went nowhere, but perhaps downloaded some piece of malware on my machine. So really thinking about before you click, thinking about what it is before you click is a good, um, uh, is a good habit to get into. If you know you've paid your Netflix bill, if you, you know you don't have 20 people using your account, it's very unlikely that it would have been suspended. Here's another one. Uh, and this one might be one that you get at your company, right? A, 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 an alert has been triggered, right? Uh, this alert is triggered whenever someone gets access to read your user's email. Um, then there's a button to investigate. Looks pretty official, um, but you typically, a user wouldn't get a message that an alert has been triggered, right? That's the first clue. It's, it's probably someone in your IT department that's going to get that type of alert and you wouldn't be in, in expected to investigate something like this anyway. So doesn't really look right, but it's got an Office 365, it's got the right logo, it's got the right address for Microsoft. 
you know, if you're, if you're multitasking, right, you might just click on it and see what's up. There's the button to investigate. There it is. It's asking you, oh, it needs my Office 365 account and password so I can continue to investigate. That's what they want. They want to get your ID and password. That's how they're going to break into your system. This was actually a fake. This, this actually happened with these screens, but it was actually a fake um, email. And this is how we would know. This is the other way. Um, when in doubt, if you ever have a link to um, click on something or a link to an email address, just hover over it. Put your mouse right on it. Hover over it and see if it's actually going back to the source that supposedly sent the email. Right? Look at this email. It has nothing to do with Microsoft. It has nothing to do with your company. Um, and just it's a random email, at least to you. That's a that's a super clue that it's not a legitimate site or email. Here's another one. Um, urgency wins, right? It's a, it's the end of the year. We really need to get these gift cards done. It's typically um, an email to a, an associate in a company, supposedly from an executive. You know, sometimes the executive's out of town. I, I can't really get to, to do this. Can you do it for me? It's important to have checks and balances so that any associate that gets an email from an executive to spend money should have to call somebody else, should have to verify it with somebody else. And, and we recommend that those procedures never be deviated against. This is a typical one. Hover again, right? Jane Doe is probably not going to send an email from CEO Verizon Talk at AOL, right? Professor Jane Doe is going to, to um, send an email from her place of business or from her home, right? Good clue right there that it's not legitimate. So we wanted to show you those because they really do look real and they could be scenarios that would happen or similar to scenarios that would happen. But the, the key point is unknown, unexpected sources um, will ask you to do something. And it's typically send money, give me information, enter your ID and password. Reputable companies are never going to send an email asking for personal information. They will never send a link that immediately goes to an ID and password either. If it's from your bank, if it's somewhere where you have an account and you see that kind of email, don't click it from the email. Go outside of email, log into the site, go to www.bankofamerica.com, log in, and you can see messages, right? If there's some action you need to take, the message will also be in the application. Or pick up the phone and call whoever it is and say, did you really send me this? Just verifying, um, I got an email, didn't look quite right. And uh, they will appreciate that you called, even if it's legitimate. And even if it's from a trusted source, right? If you don't feel right about responding to an email, don't. I get a phone solicitation today for, for a cause, right? And I just make it a practice never to respond to phone solicitations. You just don't know if they're real or not. Same applies to email. Okay, and here's where we can stop for a minute and, uh, and answer questions. There's probably a few in the chat room. Um, and package, it might be McAfee's internet security package. Those are pretty good packages. You just need to make sure they're on. You need to make sure that they're updated. Most packages will update automatically for you. Um, I will say uh, your, your um, typical Microsoft operating system now has pretty good malware protection as well, but we do recommend that you, that you buy a package that's got some internet security. The internet security will help in terms of filtering malicious sites, right? It may have settings um, to um, block certain categories of sites. Right. So if you don't want your children going to to malicious sites, if you don't want, you know, you want to just block particular types of sites, you can do that. 
Um, so I would definitely think about using a package. A lot of folks will do freeware versions and that's okay as long as you make sure that they're updated. So the um, traditional packages have signatures that come out almost daily, sometimes more than once a day. And they'll update your software to detect certain types of files and, and uh, malware signatures. The newest types are looking for more behavioral aspects of malware. So they're looking for particular processes or actions that are taking. And because they're on thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of machines, they can do a little bit of artificial intelligence and ensure that they are morphing their detections at the same time that malware is morphing. So if you do nothing else, good package, continuous upgrades, um, automatic updates, if you can do that. Another question, Susan, what do you do if you click on one of these links while multitasking and you realize you screwed up and allowed yourself to get sucked in? Great question, Aviva. Thank you. Ah, yeah, that, that is a great question. We're going to get into what do I do if I've been hacked? Um, if you've clicked on a link and it's asking you for more information and you can stop, absolutely stop. If you've clicked on a link that was supposed to take you somewhere and it didn't, and you clicked on it again and it still didn't, you can pretty much assume that, that something is going on. And you wanna first get off of the internet, unplug your machine. Um, and you'll, if you have your antivirus software, you'll want to pull that up. You'll want to run a scan. You'll want to see if, if you can identify anything. If you feel like something has happened to your machine or if that ransomware message pops up, your, your account is encrypted and, um, and you'll get it back if you put in a credit card number, you can, you can do a couple of things. You can, don't pay the, we don't recommend that you pay the ransom. You just, you know, you're encouraging that continued behavior. Um, it's always a good practice. I think Nancy, you're gonna talk about some of this to, to have your data backed up. So if you do, you can restore to yesterday, right? You can restore your machine to a couple of days ago. You can reinstall the entire operating system if you need to. So it's run your anti-malware software, restore to a prior point if you can. If you have given credentials, right? If you have logged in ID password and then realized, oh my God, that didn't take me to my bank immediately change your ID and password with your bank. Call them, let them know what happened so they can put you on a fraud alert and think about anywhere else you may be using that same ID and password and change it. It's a pain in the neck, but you've got to really think through. Um, every scenario is different. You got to think through the scenario. What's the worst thing that could happen here? And have I used this credential anywhere else? Um, so th those are some tips. There's probably a few more on the slides as we go through, but that's that's some initial thoughts. I would say if anybody's uh, on a work computer and they do happen to have um, like a co-fence or a little fish up in your corner, of course, report it. If you don't have such a program, you should report it to your IT if you did something and probably unplug your computer right away, especially if you're back in the office. Um, but you want to make sure that uh, the folks in the home office know that you may have clicked on something and caused a problem. Um, there's a password manager question. I'm gonna push this, that off to the side, but we're gonna to get to that in a few minutes. And there was a question about what about on your phone if you click uh, this on the phone? Um, Susan, do you wanna answer that? Yeah, yeah, there is malware prevention for the phones um, as well. Sometimes it's just looking for you to enter something. Um, so again, if you've entered it, take the actions to um, uh, to reset your password. On your phone, if you have anti-malware software, you're going to want to look to see if you're going to do the same thing. You want to run a scan, see if you can see what happened. Um, if I if that happened on my phone, I would take it down to the Verizon store and say, I just did something, right? I don't have IT staff to, to be able to uh, really dig in and see if I can find out what happened, but, but they can often um, take some action to help you out there as well. Look for, an, look for files that shouldn't be there and, um, or an application that shouldn't be there. Sometimes you'll see a new icon, right? That you can, 
that you can delete. So you can take the obvious actions, but do try and get some help because you just don't know what might still be there that uh, you can't see. Okay, so before we move on, I'm just gonna say, please also note that just because it's phishing on your email, you they're doing smishing, which is a phone call and vishing, which is on, um, on texting. So there's all sorts of types of way to get you to click a link or give information. Uh, just the multitasking is one of the worst things you can do uh, because you're not thinking and you start clicking away. So be really, really cautious. Um, and um, when in doubt, don't click. Okay, so we are going to now move on. And um, thank you, Susan. Um, always a pleasure to do this with you. It's been a while. Um, okay. How many of you use the same password for your banking as you do for your personal accounts? I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand. I'm gonna guess that a few of you might raise your hand and say, yes, you use your same password more than once. This is pretty common. And we're gonna have a conversation on, um, this could be one of the first things you do when you end this class tonight. And we will talk about some good tips, but uh, let's dive into some good password hygiene right now. Okay, next slide. All right. So Susan was saying there's a bunch of passwords in the big dark bad web. And uh, the top three are one, two, three, four, five, six, the word password, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. If anybody has that password tonight, please go change your password after this class. That's really important, okay? Because that's the top three most used passwords out, uh, out there. And that's a little concerning. The average user uses their bad password 14 times. So we know that people are using their reusing their passwords. What we're going to talk about, though, is your work and your personal life keeping it separate. First of all, your work and pass your work and personal passwords should never be the same. And hopefully, your companies have given you that uh, that conversation and you've chatted about that. But more importantly, your banking should not be the same. So anything, whether it's your 401k, if you're with Fidelity or any other company, or your banks, make sure it's not the same as your Google as your LinkedIn or anything else, okay? Keep your life separate. Um, and we'll talk about password managers in a second because people have been asking about that. And so we'll talk about why that's important. Um, enable two-factor, oh, sorry. Let's talk about passphrases instead of passwords. So in the past, when you know we all started putting in passwords and you're gonna have the opportunity in, in no time to be passwordless, but the, kind of the, the world hasn't gotten there yet. But there's, you know, there's great ways to uh, protect yourself while you have, have to have a password. So use complexity, make it a little longer. There's an example here of um, a complex one. Use a misspelled word. If instead of a number, use like a zero instead of a, a, an O or something like that. There's ways to make it a little more complicated. You just wanna make it harder so people can't break your password, okay? Opt into two-factor authentication whenever you can. So I'm gonna explain what that is. Whenever that option's available and you see it a lot more often now, it's your username. It's your password, and it's another form of authentication to say, I am who I say I am, and I have the authority to go into this account or do this. Um, so often it's a text that goes to your phone. This is a great opportunity for you just to add another layer, and hopefully, you know, this it's not that uh, that onerous on you, and it's a good opportunity for you just to, to protect yourself one bit more. Okay, protect your password list. Um, I'm going to suggest you not have a password list, but you probably do. So if you do, don't save it on your computer under password list. Call it something else. Lock it. Um, if you have it in your house, put it somewhere where you protect it, okay? Like just don't leave it out on the counter, you know, beside your phone. If you keep your passwords in your phone under, let's say, Bank of America and the password, I would suggest that's not a good idea. But um, I can't tell you not to have a password list, but be careful if you do. Consider a password manager. Uh, US adults have between 90 and 135 different applications with a, with, um, that require a set of, of credentials. That's a ton of passwords to remember. You're not gonna remember that many, and that's why people often use them over and over again. They use their dogs' names, they use birthdays, they use their kids' names, their hometown. If you're putting all that on this on the uh, on your social media, it's not that hard to figure out. Hey, maybe Nancy put in Boston 2020 or Cooper 2020 21. You know, something like that. So be thoughtful when you're choosing your passwords, but go ahead and use a password manager. I think that's really great. Um, I would suggest LastPass, Susan. Any others that you would suggest that you you've used or, or recommend? 
Yeah, no, that's a pretty popular one. There are a couple, couple other ones out there. I um, mean, and you can, you know, you can Google best password managers, right? And you'll get some, some CNET or some other um, yeah. uh, comparisons of them. So choose one that's right for you, but just make sure it's a reputable one. Yeah. And then I would, I would suggest everybody tonight or tomorrow and you're, you know, filling some time, check Have I Been Pawned? So this is an opportunity for you to put in your, um, to put in your email to see if it's compromised. And what it does is you put your email in and it will show all the breaches that have happened recently and see if your email has been part of any of those. If that's the case, what you wanna do is you wanna go change your password, especially for that breach. Let's say it's Microsoft or Target or somewhere else. Um, but also if you're using that password somewhere else, which you probably are, you need to change that password everywhere else as well, right? So you really need to be um, tracking this or being really like, you know, the targets in the world get this password, the bank gets this password and Google gets X, right? Um, I'm not saying you need to have 125 passwords. I'm just saying, be careful where you do use your passwords and that way you'll be able to keep, you know, better track of it. And I'll just, um, I'll just put in another plug for two-factor authentication. You know, we talked about the billions of IDs and passwords that are for sale on the web, the automated programs that try and use them on whatever website they can find. That second factor stops them from being able to take the next step. It's not foolproof. There are ways around it. But for the criminal that's going to just be running scripts and trying, 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 they'll move on if they know that there's a two-factor authentication prompt. So particularly where you're, where you're moving money, your banking, your credit card companies, anywhere where you might be moving money, if your bank doesn't offer it yet, they should. And it's a good, um, it's a good reason to complain if they're not offering it for their online transactions or move to another bank that has better security <laughs> is what I would argue. <laughs> okay, <That too. laughs> next slide. Um, protecting yourself uh, at yourself and your data at home. Okay, we talked a little bit about this, but the automatic updates to your home and your PCs, your system and anti-malware software, this is really important. You need to turn on your automatic updates. You wanna make sure you're using an, um, a reputable anti-malware product. Uh, Susan referenced this earlier, This, if it's free, it might not have the best, uh, strongest settings. So you wanna be thinking about that. Make sure you have a good one. You wanna block those unwanted programs and malicious sites. It's really, really important. Okay, backing up your data. I'm sure you've heard this, you know this, I don't need to tell you this, but more importantly, store your sensitive data offline. Do you really need your taxes on your laptop? You know, you wanna make sure that anything that you think is really personal and important, you wanna, your crown jewels, as they say, you want to make sure they're they're offline somewhere else and backed up, and that's you know on a thumb drive or um, an external hard drive. Keep that in mind and be thoughtful about what you do keep uh, and storing on your computer and what is easily accessible. Um, be careful when you use public unsecured wireless connections. We're going to talk about this in a second, but just think of this as anytime it's an open wireless, it's like your front door is open. So be thoughtful what you're doing when you're on an open wire the Wi-Fi. Okay. Um, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, encrypt when you're encrypt your PC and laptop, encrypt when you're sharing data, especially if you're working from home. I would argue that you should really probably talk to your manager or your IT to make sure that you are um, saving and sending information properly um, and also making sure you're not you know, breaking any policies about what you should or should not be doing. So um, if you uh, have the opportunity to have that conversation, um, or they should have told you that when you when you moved to working from working from home. But just in case they have it and you're storing information, be thoughtful about that. Um, limit your personal information on social media. We talked about this a little bit, especially with passwords. Um, we want to make sure that um, you're not telling people you go on vacation. You're not sharing your dog's name or your hometown, your birthday. That just be thoughtful if, especially, you're using those in your passwords. Um, but you also need to monitor your accounts. So that's your bank account your credit history and your digital footprint. You wanna just be careful that people aren't attacking you from all ends and you aren't even aware of it. Um, paying special attention to your kids, okay? Your kids, they're at risk and they're putting your data at risk, right? They're browsing, they're gaming, they're social media. These are all um, opportunities for them to be exposed. Um, you wouldn't leave your kids alone in a crowd and think of the web like a big bad crowd, right? So you wanna make sure you're protecting them the best that you can. 
And honestly, I think you should monitor them as well. But that's another conversation on privacy for another day. Um, your aging parents, Susan mentioned this, but predators are everywhere. So your aging parents, you need to have the conversation about fishing and about, you know, um, protecting themselves, um, phone and internet scans. These are all important things to, um, to keep in mind and have this conversation. It's a good Sunday night dinner or Friday night dinner conversation to be talking about some things that everybody can do to make sure that they're keeping everybody safe. Um, you know, one click, that's all it takes really. Yeah. Susan, I miss uh, no, no, that's great. I remember when my daughter was, I think she wanted her first phone at 11. And um, I, I think I got her one because of course I'm a good mother, but I said, I will pry and I will spy. So just know that <laughs> and, and you can't stop me. And I think just the, the notion that I could do it deterred her from, from, um, from, you know, revealing anything she shouldn't, but I did check her social media. I made sure that she didn't put too much information out there. You know, I yell at my brother all the time because he turns on his just checked in at, at Las Vegas, Nevada, or wherever he's traveling to next. There's so much information that can so easily be revealed. Um, and children need to learn that um, at a young age. Absolutely. So next slide, we're going to talk about the Internet of Things. Here's a question for you. How many devices do you have in your house? Susan, we're going to hit the slide. Um, yeah, I'm trying. It's not going. Hang on. There we go. Okay, there we go. How many devices in your home are connected to the Internet? Now think about this. This is your Alexa, your Nest, your TV, your games. Who knows? Maybe your refrigerator, your coffee maker. I have no idea. Uh, I have about six and I wasn't even trying. Susan says she has about 12. Anybody that has a bunch of kids probably has even more than that. Um, this is really important, right? So every one of them has a password. So you need to change the password. You do not want to leave it to the default password. Um, but you also want to take time to understand any other protections that they have in place. So think about your configurations and just realize this is just access into your house. And, you know, it's often best to probably, you know, unplug Alexa the, half the time. She doesn't need to be recording everything doing or turn her off and she doesn't need to record everything going on in your life. Okay. Yeah. A common, um, a common uh, error is to not secure your wireless. Right. So you can, you can, you can put on your wireless and without a password, um, but you shouldn't because that means someone can pull up to your, to your front, the front of your house with their own laptop and be on your network in a heartbeat. Um, so make sure you secure your wireless. And as Nancy said, you know, your, your ring has some security settings. You don't want anybody to be able to tap into that. That's probably got its own wireless as well. Um, and thinking about, I just bought a heater for my house that I can remotely manage, <laughs> a space heater. And so the, the, the most innocuous things have, have internet access or can connect to your wireless and um, just read the instructions as you purchase those things and make sure you either don't connect them or understand how to connect them securely. All right, next slide. Right. We're gonna get to your questions. I do, I do see questions coming in, I promise. All right, freeze your credit. Um, as everybody knows, there's three bureaus, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. This gives you the opportunity to restrict your credit report and also that identity thieves can't open accounts in your name, right? So slight little bit of hassle, I won't lie, but it's much easier now than it's ever been ever since the Equifax <laughs> breach uh, for you to freeze your credit and it doesn't cost you money. So take a few minutes, complete this, um, and then if you happen to be buying a car, getting a mortgage or um, getting a new credit card, you can unfreeze it fairly easily for like 24 hours, 36 hours, and then it freezes back automatically. Um, really important to do this, do this for yourself and do this for your children. This is really one of the best things you can do. Yep, synthetic identities. They'll, they'll take your children's social security number identity and they'll They'll create their own with it. By the time your child's 18 and, and wants to leverage that credit, it's ruined. So it's, it's really important to, to freeze your children's credit until they, until they need it. All right, next slide. We're gonna talk about mobile phone security. All right, so first things first, gonna keep it really simple. Enable your screen lock if you already haven't done it today, okay? Set up the biometrics. That's your fingerprint or face recognition. 
set up the passcode so it's longer than four numbers because four numbers isn't that hard to break. Okay, so that, like that's the first basics. Let's do that. Enable two-factor authentication whenever you are using other applications. Um, let's talk about making Wi-Fi network secure. So if you happen to be at a Starbucks or Marriott or somewhere else, um, and there's open Wi-Fi, be thoughtful about what you're doing while you're there. I would argue that you probably shouldn't be doing your banking while you're sitting at Starbucks and wait till you get home. If they happen to have Wi-Fi that is closed and you need a password, it's a little more secure. That doesn't mean the bad guy didn't ask for the password as well, slightly more secure. So you just wanna make it a little harder and just don't do your banking or personal stuff while you're sitting at Starbucks and browse the internet or, you know, Twitter, Twitter, whatever it is one does while you're having your cup of coffee. Um, lock your SIM card. Uh, most people don't do this, uh, but I think it's really important to enable the SIM pin um, on your mobile service. This prevents someone from stealing your SIM card and um, um, ensuring your number can't be ported. And I do know folks at Fidelity who have had this done. And then of course, what happens is those wonderful things where I told you to have two-factor authentication, it's now going to their phone and now they can move money and do sorts of all sorts of other things. So these things are all interconnected and you just really wanna make sure that you know when your phone is, uh, someone's taken over your phone. And I asked this guy, I said, didn't you realize that you hadn't been getting any email or something? He goes, yeah, I just thought something was a little odd and I didn't get anything for six hours. Like he did notice something was wrong with his phone, but it was, you know, it was a work day, he wasn't really paying attention. So how do you do that? You just, you Google that. And um, I can't do it off the top of my head. I can't remember, but it's, um, you know, Google it on, you know, locking your SIM card for iPhone and the, the instructions are right there and it's not that hard to do. Okay. Um, avoid charging stations. And I know this one sounds really odd and you're like, why Nancy, why would I do that on? Let me explain. Um, a public charging station can be attacked by a hacker and they can download malware there. So you plug in what you think is innocuous little plug to go, you know, you're sitting at the airport in the mall and you want to, you want to charge your phone. And all of a sudden now you've put malware on your computers or you've put it on your phones. Plug your phone directly into a, um, a plug. Um, and that's, I would say that same for a mall, um, the airport or a hotel. Don't use their, um, don't use their um, charging stations if you can avoid it. All right, Susan, did I miss anything here? No, no, very good. And, and the SIM card theft means someone called, I have Verizon, right? Someone called Verizon and said, I lost my phone, but I just got a new one. I just need the number uh, transitioned over and you exchange some information and all of a sudden your number's on somebody else's phone and the service is transferred. So that's that's what that is. And it's becoming more and more common. And honestly, what they try to do is they try to, they then go try to attack you at your, possibly your, let's say, 401k provider. And I can tell you that Susan and I saw quite a bit of fraud there on that particular case. And they, you know, you just didn't even know that your number was, was, um, was ported over. Yeah. There's Next just slide. so much, there's so much to do. If you think about, you know, you think about how you upkeep your home, there's always things that need to be done. You've got to do your windows, got to check your roof, got to make sure there's no leaks in the basement, right? There's a whole litany of things that you do for your home and just think about your technology in the same way so that you're, you're making sure that you're keeping it up. You're doing the right things from a protection standpoint, um, and um, you, it will go a long way to make sure that you're secure. I would also say we've we've thrown a ton at you. Okay, so first of all, the deck will be posted up on the website, but also you can't do everything right away. And I don't think you have to do everything right away. But what I would suggest is you do a couple of things, and we'll talk about the top ten list we have at the end of this, and we'll talk about that in a second because we don't expect you to do every single bullet here. Nobody does, but you want to put, put a couple obstacles in the way. Yeah, absolutely. Susan. Yeah, so so you were compromised. What do you do? And, and we've talked about some of this already. One of the most important things to do is to remove the, the device from the network and, and power it down. That will at least prevent that malware from spreading. That ransomware that, that I talked about will go from one machine to the next to the next. It will travel through the network. Other pieces of malware, what we call worms, right? And they just worm their way through a network and they infect anything that might be vulnerable. So it's important to, to get it off of your network and make sure that it's not on wireless either. 
power it down. If you're in a position that you have an IT person that can help you, particularly if you're if it's a if it's a work computer, call them right away and and see if if they can help you. They might walk you through how to check for signs of compromise. Right when you turn that machine back on, shouldn't be connected to the network. If you have some good anti malware software, you should be able to run a scan. Uh, sometimes it will tell you that it cleaned it. Sometimes it will tell you that it needs to be, be removed manually. And sometimes you can't even get to it if it's ransomware, right? You may just have that, um, that message that you need to pay some money. And in that case, you, you're gonna lose what was on the machine today, but if you've backed up your data, you shouldn't, you shouldn't have to worry at least about that. And you can restore that device from a prior point or just completely reinstall the original software. Um, you can take it to, you can take it to a, a Best Buy, right? They've got help, um, what do they call it? The Geek Squad, right? If you, if you really don't know what to do. And, and honestly, if I was by myself and, and did everything that I could do and didn't know what to do next, that's exactly what I do. I take it to a I take it to a company like that, that, that might be able to help me. You'll pay, but they should be able to help you there. Um, definitely update your anti-malware software. And um, if, you, if you reach out to them as well, they may be able to guide you in terms of how to identify or how to eradicate what has, what has hit your machine. Once you clean it up, you do wanna update your patches. Very often the, the malware took hold because it either had a password, right? Your administrator password, you wanna change your passwords, of course, um, but you wanna make sure you have all the updates done as well. You should have automatic updates on your machine. If you haven't had to reboot your machine in the last month, then, then that's probably a problem. You should look and see if your updates are turned on. Um, you, you, there's usually a way that you can check um, in your system settings, check for updates make sure those updates are done and look for the setting that says update automatically. Um, so if you haven't gotten that message, you haven't gotten an update in a long time. Do make sure we talked about this before. All the, all the places where you use th those credentials, change them, notify your banks. Even if you change it right away, you're going to want fraud alerts on, on your accounts. Freeze your credit if you haven't already done it. You know, a note about your banks, if you do online transactions, you can receive notifications. Um, turn those notifications on. Turn the notification on for transactions. I have any transaction over zero, I get a notification for, right? I delete them most of the time because I know I've made the transaction, but every once in a while, I'll maybe get a text or, a, or an email that, um, that gives me pause, right? And 90% of the time, it's just something I forgot about. But there have been times where someone purchased $700 worth of Nike shoes on my, on my card and it wasn't me. So, but I saw that and I could immediately call and say that wasn't me. They took care of it right away, got a new card. So the earlier you can detect that, the less pain you'll go through in the long run. And if you are compromised and th just think through, um, so someone got on my computer, someone got on my home network, what kind of data do I have and do I need to notify anyone else? Do, do I have work stuff on my machine? Was it a work machine? Did I have you know, my parents' tax returns on my machine? Did I have children's data, other people's data? You do wanna just understand uh, what data you may have had of others so that if you did have somebody else's social security number, they might want to freeze their credit as well, right? It's kind of the contact tracing, if you will, from a, um, from a computer virus perspective, but, but you do want to just give a little bit of thought to that as well. Um, but my advice would be, if it's not obvious, do get some help. Um, call, like I said, call your anti-malware company, run down to Best Buy, go to the Geek Squad. They'll charge you for it but they probably can help you. And if you have an IT contact, either for your business, your home network, um, or the company that you work for, absolutely call them right away, reach out to them. So when you go on to start adding, you know, some security features, privacy features, and your two-factor authentication, take a look at those. There's a lot, a lot of banks 
and financial institutions have done a great job. I would argue that there's some that are not, and I won't call out one in Canada for the record, but uh, most of them have done a really good job. And you wanna, you wanna just you know, check a couple of those boxes, like Susan said, and be alerted. It's really important to know when something's happening in your account. You hope it's you doing it, but just in case that it's not, um, it's really, uh, it's a no brainer. So, you know, turn those things on. Um, let's, um, let's go to the, the next slide. And so this slide is, this is what we call the top 10, right? And it covers a lot of what we just said. We know that you're not gonna do everything we just said tonight, okay? But what we want you to do is take a look at this and do a few of these things and think about it. Maybe this week or over the next couple of weeks, you start, you know, thinking about your passwords, doing your backups, thinking about your Wi-Fi. You want to make sure that you put some friction in the system, that the bad actors move on from you to your neighbor or to the next person that's doing nothing, right? A few bumps in the road and they go, oh, it's not worth going after Nancy or Susan. We're going to go after the next guy. So really think about it. Do a few things. This will be up um, as well on the um, womenology.org uh, site for uh, Think Tomorrow. So you'll have access to all this materials. Um, and so we're gonna go through the Q&A and if people wanna ask any questions, you can shout them out, but we'll also go through the, uh, the chat room as well. So feel free to put them in. Susan, have you caught a few that we wanna hit? Yeah, I'm sharing my screen, so I didn't bring them up. Okay, but, um, let, me, let me scroll up and see if we caught everything, okay? Yeah, okay. All right, um, we talked about firewalls, we talked about password managers. Um, do you have a specific recommendations for Mac versus PC? Shanhab, I'm not sure what the question is. Would you mind elaborating? You still with us? Oh yes, I'm here. I'm just I, wondering, um, I was under the impression that Mac is safer for, for malware. Um, and we don't have anti like um, um, virus. On, on, on Mac machines. So I was wondering if there's any specific instructions for, for Mac users. Yeah, yeah, you know, typically Macs are a little less prone to malware, um, but still susceptible. Um, the, the Mac operating system does come with some protections already built in, but the reputable companies, the semantics, the McAfee's, the ones that, you know, are, are very prevalent on home PCs, also make product for the Mac. So we do recommend product, even if it is a Mac. Awesome, okay. thank you. Yep. Thank you. Got a question. On my iPhone 11, um, the green light in the top right corner is illuminated, indicating the camera is on or activated. I've closed off camera option on all apps. The prime suspects are <laughs> Zoom, Insta, or FaceTime. I've tried to turn it off, but to no avail. Ideas, suggestions. Never been asked that question. That's oh, a good one. yeah, yeah. In your settings, the, I, I, I've had this happen. I've had to look many places. In your settings, you can look. I'm gonna, I'm gonna look right now. I think you, you can, have to go under each one of those and see if you, if your camera is open, right? Is that where you yes, have to go? Yes, you you can go to yeah. You go to each. Well, you can go to your camera, and sometimes you can see all of the apps that are using it, and um, you can turn it off or you go to the app and you'll see the setting that it's yeah. using your camera. Um, Susan, <laughs> Susan and Nancy, I, it's the person who asked the question. I've done that. Right. I went through every single one of my apps. I turned off enable camera. I turned, the, the next thing they told me to do was that what you, I, they wanted me to go back to default settings. And I just wasn't quite ready to go back to default settings yet. It might just not be on, it might just be activated or accessed it might not be like actually looking <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah sometimes it'll be it'll it'll have like a only on when in use when the app's yeah. in use which is a which is kind of an in-between state um i don't know if i could tell without poking around on it um mm -hmm. for the apple store because it's still on. yeah it's i would on. Yeah, I, I would just take it into the Apple store and say, just fix this for me. <laughs> That's what I would do. All right, um, let's see what we have here. How do you encrypt communications? Yeah, okay. Typically you're going to, um, uh, typically you're gonna do this through your work, right? Your, your work should already have 
um, encrypted communications uh, enabled for you. Your general email systems now are um, protecting mail from, from mail server to mail server. It's much better than it used to be. If you're, if you're doing a lot of sensitive transactions, you can use a secure email service like a um, uh, Bizcom is one, for instance. There are others out there as well. If you do a lot of uh, sensitive communications, consider doing that. If you're working with your tax advisor, if you're working with, with your, um, uh, your bank and you need to do um, some transmission of uh, uh, sensitive data, ask them to say, I want to use a secure transmission solution. And they're going to say, okay, use, use X, or they're going to say password protect um, the document, or they're going to say our email is already secure and, and you can have some assurances there. When you do need to communicate via a secure email or someone's assured you that the that the tunnel if you will is secure i i don't keep sensitive things in my email even after i send them i delete my sent email and just keep it out of the email system that's that's one other tip i would do if you're not confident that it went securely but um, if you do a lot of sensitive communications i would consider a, um, a, a secure email service. And, and what that does, they, they will, it's kind of an intermediary and they will house the document with an ID password. They encrypt it on their servers and the, the receiver has to log in and get that document. So it's not like, it's not being um, sent over a public uh, viewable pipe, right? It's going, it's going over HTTPS to a place someone else is logging in over HTTPS and retrieving it. Right. Um, I think we answered this one, but just in case, if you're at home and techn technologically <laughs> challenged, who can help you with things like securing your Wi-Fi? Yep, you can. Um, I've done a lot of Googling in my time <laughs> to, to be able to, <laughs> to, to figure out how to secure my Wi-Fi. Um, one thing that you might do um, if you've got uh, it's cable or, you know, the, the, the Wi-Fi is part of your cable setup quite often, right? You can call them and see if they can help you identify the settings. Um, it had to have been set up somehow. Look on the, look on the device and sometimes it'll tell you um, what kind of device it is and then you can just Google you know, secure my device. If you can, if you can even see where your um, where your wireless points are um, um, on your PC, there's usually a way to get to the settings and turn on um, the the Wi-Fi encryption. I know I'm not explaining that well because it's usually going to be in front of me to be able to do that. Um, but it's it's not hard to figure out. You just need to you need to give it a little bit of thought. And again, if if you took your um, um, you could call, geez, you could call the um, uh, the manufacturer's support number on on that piece of Wi-Fi equipment, whether it's a Netgear or something else um, as well. And a lot of them have apps and they have instructions inside, you know, on, you know, FAQs and, and helpful. So most of the apps, you can even see whether, you know, you can change your password right from there for, for many of them today that you see. Uh, do you need to freeze your credit on all three? Yes. Yes, you yes. do. Take yeah. the time. Do all three, please. Um, should you freeze your children's credit as soon as they have a social security number? Yes. yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, just... Let's see, the SIM card, you need to look that up. I can't tell you how to do it off the phone. Otherwise, if you want, call me later and I'll tell you how to do it. We'll both do it together. I have locked it. It's worth doing, especially after a friend of mine lost money because his SIM, his SIM card info was stolen. I did it immediately. Um, let's see, locking your SIM card. Turn on notifications, let's see. In my Facebook account, uh, my Facebook account was hacked. Other than letting others know and changing my password, is there anything else I need to do? 
um, think through whether you use that password anywhere else and change it there as well. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. And is there any information, just think through, is there anything out there that you should be concerned about? Um, a lot of times they'll hack it just to, I mean, just to either gain information or sometimes to use it. I had talked to somebody whose Facebook got hacked and, and someone just used their Facebook account to, to do some reach out to, to do some, you know, kind of uh, nefarious um, social engineering of their own. Um, if, if you've got people that you communicate with frequently on Facebook, you might just let them know. By the way, um, if you see anything weird, my Facebook account got hacked. I changed my password, but just want to let you know. Uh, next question. For LastPass, there's a free version. Is this good or should I upgrade? Um, the, the free version usually is just minus some benefits. Um, my, my sense would be I don't use LastPass, so I couldn't say for sure, but Generally, the free versions are just minus some some features, right? Um, so I, I would check out what those features are, but the, the free version is likely quite secure as well. This is a good one. You're gonna like this one, Susan. Should I be concerned if I have an older laptop that is still on Windows 7 now that it's no longer supported? Yes, you should. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and this goes for your iPad too, for everybody who hasn't updated their iPads and uh, doesn't have any, you know, haven't done any uh, software yeah. updates. Absolutely. Yeah. Lori, you know why? go get a new yeah. laptop. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah, the vulnerabilities, Windows vulnerabilities come out all the time. And at some point, uh, Microsoft just stops doing patches for them. So where Windows 7 might might be vulnerable to something, it's just never going to be patched. Um, yeah. So it's, it's not worth it. it. It's, it's not safe. Yeah, it's not safe. Okay. Do you recommend VPNs? Is this more secure? Yeah, yeah, particularly if you're doing a lot of um, a lot of uh, work over wireless. Nancy mentioned, you know, the um, the Starbucks and particularly if you're if you're traveling in hotels, um, VPNs will will absolutely help secure your communications. Uh, and sometimes the anti sorry, I was just going to say sometimes the anti malware vendors come with VPN options as well. I think Semantic yeah. has. Do you mean that your kids' credit should be frozen even if you haven't been hacked, or only if you have in fact? No. Everybody has to freeze their credit. Doesn't matter. Yeah, it's a prevention. It's a prevention. It's a preventable matter. step. Should do it. Just do it. Uh, let's see. We'll keep going here. Um, let's see. I think we're good. Any other questions? And you're more than welcome to throw them out or put them in the chat. Um, Susan, you want to hit one more slide? Yeah. One more. That's it. No, this one. All yeah, right, we're going to yeah. give you our emails if anybody has any questions or concerns and, you know, don't ask me how to do your uh, your router, but, you know, you're more than welcome to ask me a question <laughs> and I'll try to get you the answer. Um, Susan, will you hit one more slide as well? We just want to thank everybody for joining us. Look, I'm a, nice. I, I, Jude and I are thrilled that anybody wants to come out and listen to these topics. We're having a blast and we're really glad you came out tonight. There's three more sessions coming up and a couple more that are coming up right behind me. So, We'd love for you to keep joining us, keep learning with us and um, supporting one another. So uh, thank you. We will stay on for a bit if anybody wants to uh, ask a question or two or chat, but uh, if not, have a lovely night and, uh, and thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Yes, it was great fun. Appreciate the, appreciate, really appreciate you listening. You all being here. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thanks everyone. Be safe. Stay well. Look forward to seeing you next time.